I've noticed, as some of you have, uh, now that I'm 42 years old, soon to, soon to be 43, that uh, I've kind of learned over the, over the years a lot about how my body works. Have you noticed that? You notice kind of the peculiarities of your own body? There's certain asymmetries that I recognize, certain things I know are going to hurt after I walk a long distance or something like that. But every now and then, a little input from other people can help. In the last five years, stacy has been kind enough to remind me that when I eat spaghetti, uh, I get spaghetti sauce smeared around the corners of my mouth almost every single time. So I've learned how to deal with this preemptively. I do what the rest of you do instinctively and actually wipe my mouth afterward. A little spaghetti around the mouth is not a big deal, but sometimes somebody else may point something out to you that's a little bit more serious. Stacy and I used to teach in the fifth and sixth grade Sunday school class where at the church we were part of in the Chicago area. And one morning, one of our more perceptive students asked me if I had accidentally touched my face with one of the purple markers we were working with at the time. And I said, no, I don't think so, and looked, and sure enough, there was this purple spot on my face that had showed up pretty much overnight. Well, I went to the doctor, and the doctor looked at this spot and said, you know, you need to get this checked out by the dermatologist. So the dermatologist said, well, we're going to need to do a biopsy. And they did the biopsy, and the results came back that, well, this isn't cancer, but the cells aren't really normal either. So we're going to need to get rid of it. And so uh, they, they edited my face a little bit. And thankfully, they cut the incision in a spot where it was on the frown line. So now that I'm older than I was at the time, you can't see the scar as well as you used to be able to. As you have begun to hear about Discover 40 and the church values we'd be revealing over the next several weeks, I hope you were intrigued to find out what those seven values would be. I can tell you, if you've seen the Discover 40 workbook, you already know them. You, you can find them in the back of the book, so they're, they're not secret anymore. And as you read through these values, I imagine most of them seem like good, challenging ideals, you know, the sorts of things we would never deny as a church, But there's one of them that I expect, for some of you, stuck out a little bit like that spot on your face that you weren't expecting to see. It's this one this week, the third value. For for me, I would imagine that most of you looked at this value and thought, this is kind of like the purple mole of the seven. And it's not just my intuition that leads me to believe this. As we presented these values in various leadership groups, this week's value drew the most attention. It seems a little different from the others. It puts something on our radar screen that we might not have considered before. In my judgment, the value we'll look at this morning is the least likely value to appear in other churches' sets of values. Two weeks ago, we said, we seek a relationship with God first. The prior Sunday, last Sunday, Pastor John helped us understand that we respond to God's word. This week's value, which you'll find in the message outline within your bulletin, is this. We work to understand how people in our communities think. We work to understand how people in our communities think. This value, probably more than any other will cover, requires us to clarify it and justify it. And that's the purpose of today's message. First we are going to take some time and consider why we should even bother. Why should we work to understand people in our communities? Why is that important? That's going to occupy the majority of our time today. Second, we'll consider what we should understand about people in our communities. 
What's important to learn? What would we, we be looking to know? Third, we'll consider how we can understand people in our communities. We'll look at practical steps we can take to get this ball rolling and begin to embody this value. So are you ready? Not very convincing. Come on, are you ready? All right, let's get started. Why should we work to understand people in our communities? It all starts with the reality that you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, have a message of good news to share. We call it the gospel, which is a word that just means good news. Sometimes we obscure the gospel. We get it confused with doing good things, or being a good person, or participating in church activities. None of these are the gospel. The good news is fundamentally news. It's a message. We can't be the gospel. We can't do the gospel. We tell the gospel. The message that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead and that freedom from everything we need to be freed from comes through trusting in the finished work of Jesus. When Jesus told his disciples to make other disciples, he made them communicators. And we, too, are communicators. Good communicators always know their audience. Good communication, good communicators know their audience because the task of communication requires something called contextualization. This is a technical word that refers to something we already all do. If you want to say something to a Chinese speaker, you have to say it in Chinese. You can't just say it in English. If you're going to address the topic of slavery, it makes a difference if your audience is predominantly African American. You don't walk into a children's classroom with a message that requires kids to sit still for 30 minutes. Okay, we get this. In all three of those examples, we see that the nature of the audience impacts the way the speaker is going to speak, the context. The call to contextualize requires us to devote ourselves to understanding the people to whom we're speaking so that we can help them see how the good news is good news to them. Now, some reason, and I have sympathy for this thinking. Well, the Bible is the word of God. If we just tell people what it says, the people who are going to get it will get it. Well, would you believe that the greatest Christian missionary of all time worked to understand the thinking of the people he was speaking to? Normally, we have you stand as we read a passage of scripture we're going to dig into. But this morning, we're going to do something a little old school, the way the early church would have done it. Don't follow along in your Bible. Don't follow along on your app. We're not going to have words on the screen. I'm just going to ask you to listen as I read the words of scripture, which would have been the experience of the scripture for the early church for a long, long time. We're going to read two passages of scripture. One of them is about four minutes the other's about three minutes. I promise you can hang with it. And here's your assignment. Don't just passively listen. As we're listening, try to see the difference in what Paul is saying to these two different audiences. The first speech that Paul gave was to a group at the synagogue in modern-day Turkey. It's a city called Pisidian Antioch. Now, these people he was speaking to had a great deal of knowledge about the Bible and about the God of the Hebrew people. So listen as Paul shares the good news with them. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. 
The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, Sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says in another psalm, You will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware. Therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. This was Paul's speech in the synagogue at Pisidian Antioch, an environment that in some ways resembles a church. People who have history, who have tradition, they know the background of what Paul is saying. Did you notice how he quoted from the scripture several times? Did you notice how he recited the history of the Hebrew people as if they already knew it? So now switch with me to a very different setting. We transition from Asia Minor to the sophisticated Greek city of Athens. Paul is speaking to pagan philosophers at a venue called Mars Hill, or also known in Greek as the Areopagus. These people know very little about Jewish, the history of the Jewish people and their scripture. They are Greek philosophers. As I read this somewhat briefer speech, see if you can pick up how Paul delivers the same good news in a different way. 
So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. How many scripture quotations did you hear in that speech? There were none. Paul did, however, quote from two pagan poets. Did you notice how his approach assumed far less knowledge from his hearers? Did you notice how it was more philosophical in tone? The point of this exercise is not, I repeat, is not to convince you that you need to have the sophistication of Paul when you share the good news with people around you. The point is this, we already know that good communicators adapt their message to the audience to which they're speaking. In comparing these two speeches, we see that the greatest mission, missionary ever did the same thing. He adapted the unchanging truth of Scripture to the context in which he was speaking. We know then from good communicators in general and from Paul's example that we need to know our audience. Someone might raise the objection, though, don't we pretty much know our audience already. I mean, these are the people around us. These are the people in our neighborhoods. We live and work with them. Well, I'm not so sure we do know our audience all that well. There are a number of factors that suggest that those in our communities think differently than we at Eastside do and that we don't really get those in our communities so well. At the most practical level, the area around the place where we meet has changed greatly since we started meeting here in 1971. Now, most of us have not been here since 1971, but it's testimony to the fact that the context of even this physical location has changed and is changing rapidly. Beyond our local setting, has the moral and religious landscape changed in the last 20, 30, 40 years? Quite a bit. There's one more factor worth noting. Many of us have been part of the church for so long that we no longer have quality relationships with those who don't know Jesus. I once heard a man liken it to a Lego. A Lego with eight little tabs on it. You know, a brick. He said, most of us, our lives are like that Lego. We have eight available tabs. And most of our tabs, as people have been in the church, are already taken up. So trying to add more relationships is inherently difficult. All this together suggests that it's not only a good thing to understand how people in our communities think, 
And we deliberately use the plural communities here to acknowledge that we represent in here more than one community. Not only is it a good thing to understand how people in our communities think, but when we say we work to understand how people in our communities think, it will indeed be work. Hopefully by now you're convinced that we should work to understand how the people in our communities think. All good communicators do it. Paul did it. And it's not like we just naturally get the people around us. If we decide that this is something we should work toward, then let's consider a few things we would want to understand about people. What is it that we would want to understand about how they think? One thing we'd want to know is what they value. And here the goal is not to understand just their favorite football team. You know, we know they like Ohio State unless there's something wrong with them. We don't just want to understand their favorite place to shop or their favorite movie or something like that. It's to understand the things that really motivate the people in our communities. And along with this, considers the attempt to find out what those around us consider authoritative. The majority of people in this country do not consider the Bible to be a consistently authoritative source on all aspects of life. But they do consider certain things authoritative. It would be good to find out what those are. In addition to knowing what people value, we might want to find out what they believe about God or maybe even more generally about spirituality, if we can put it that way. In the past, terms like God or sin or heaven and hell, good and evil, there, there was no explanation required for these terms. There was a common cultural understanding of what these things meant. But it's not really that way anymore. We can't assume that people understand what we mean, for example, when we speak about heaven or about sin. This is not always an easy pursuit. One of my experiences that has been that many people think so little about eternal things that it's difficult for them to express what they believe. So, we want to understand what people value. We want to understand perhaps what their views of spirituality or God are. But how, how could we get to this point? How could we understand people in our communities and how they think? What are some practical steps we could take toward this? Well, today, just going to focus on two how items. One, something that we want to do, and one is something we don't want to do. What is it that we want to do? Ask questions. This is a great way to understand better where people are coming from. Sharing the good news of Jesus, of course, is going to require us to speak, but in almost all situations, that speaking is going to accompany, accompany meaningful questions we would ask. This is a basic relationship building skill that comes in handy in all aspects of life, not just when dealing with those who don't follow Jesus. Think of what a relationship would look like in which one person only speaks. It's not a very good relationship. Now, this comparison, it does presuppose that we want to have relationships with people who don't know Jesus. And we do, and we'll cover that in a later value. Realize also that questions have different levels of intensity. It's much easier to answer the question, what's your favorite food, than it is to answer the question, what is your deepest fear in life? Generally speaking, it's a good idea to allow our questions to gradually increase in intensity or to allow the intensity level of our questions to be dictated by the openness that the person displays to whom we're speaking. So asking questions is important for understanding people in our communities. That's the one thing we want to do. What's the one thing we don't want to do? We don't want to be negative. I struggled with this word. 
I understand that the word negative could be misconstrued here. The point is that many people who don't follow Jesus have a bad perception of Christians, not simply because of what we believe, but because of the attitude we convey. There are many things about the prevailing culture that we can and must challenge. If you listen closely, you found Paul in both of those settings really pushing into the cultural perceptions on certain things. He was saying, you're wrong. And there are times when we absolutely need to do that, where we need to challenge the culture on certain points. But my fear, and again, this proceeds from some of my own experience and the frustration I have shown, is that sometimes the negative attitude we express toward those outside the faith has less to do with conflicting beliefs and more to do with our own pride. We think things like, how could they possibly believe that? Isn't this a Christian country? We believe we are right about certain things and that others are wrong, and that is actually a good thing. But what's not good is that when that belief leads to us to be unsympathetic or judgmental or even sometimes a little bit snobby or elitist toward those who are outside the faith. We believe Jesus is the only way, the only way to heaven. But we also believe that the only reason that we recognize this is because God in his grace revealed it to us. Not because there was something about us that was smart or inherently more worthy of knowing that news. What gives us the right to look down our noses at people who behave exactly the way we would expect apart from a relationship with Jesus? If we genuinely love those outside the faith, then even when we challenge people... We'll be straightforward. We'll tell the truth. We might be pointed, but we're not going to be harsh and judgmental. People will know that we're speaking from love. We'll be humble and sympathetic and much more likely to create the sort of relational openness that leads not just to understanding, but to impact and influence for the gospel. When you think about working to understand how people in our communities think, And all of these ideas we talked about together, remember, people only believe the good news when it strikes them as good news. We can speak the good news all we want, but if we speak in a language that people don't understand, it's not going to do very much. Similarly, if we speak in a way that people don't understand why the gospel is good news, naively figuring that what makes sense to us will make sense to them, our impact just simply won't be as great as it could be. People only believe the good news when it strikes them as good news. God gave us the world's best news. We're not going to change that news. We're just going to do our best to present it in such a way that people recognize how it addresses their deepest needs in many ways, needs that people aren't even recognizing that they have. It's going to take work, and that's why we say we work to understand how people in our communities think. If you're grasping the significance of this value, it may be hitting you. You know, this is kind of a big deal. This is going to require some sacrifice of me to live in this way. And if you're honest, you might actually say, now why would I want to inconvenience myself so that I can understand what people think? That's actually a legitimate question. And understanding our motivation begins with understanding the gospel that we're trying to communicate. Think with me for a moment about what the gospel tells us. God was not content to just let us flounder around in our sin and our wandering, and our fog of confusion. He inconvenienced himself so that we could understand the good news. 
He sent his son to live among us. And the Bible tells us that Jesus willingly laid aside the glory he was due and came and dwelt among us and lived not life in a palace, not life among the elites of the world, but as an average guy in a rural area of Israel. He didn't sidestep the realities of our lives. The scripture says he was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. It says elsewhere that he learned obedience through what he suffered. He didn't stop there. Not only did he live among us in humble circumstances, he died on our behalf, taking the penalty that we deserve, that we might have a relationship with God. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead, showing that he was able to save all who trust in him. He didn't even stop there. He sent his Holy Spirit so that those of us who have trusted in him would have his ongoing presence to be able to go to people who don't yet understand the good news, just as we once didn't understand the good news. So what will it look like for you to work to understand how the people in your community think? Would it require you to ask more questions than you typically do of your neighbor or your coworkers? Would it mean you'd choose not to do something you, so that you'd have enough margin in your day to interact more substantially with people who don't follow Jesus? Would it mean, perhaps, that your attitude toward those outside the faith would need to change? That you'd be patient enough to discover what you can affirm about them, even as you also consider how the good news challenges them? The worship team is going to come and lead us in the musical response in just a moment. But as they come, I'd like to invite you to take a moment to write down in your worship bulletin, under that part that says, My Response This Week, just one thing, one idea that struck you as we've talked about working to understand how people in our communities think. And write that insight down, and as we dismiss after the song, we'll ask the Lord to bless us in helping us to respond to that insight this week.